Okay, uh, so welcome to uh, a CCS Distinguished Climate Lecture, and thanks to uh, CCS and Graham and Margaret and others for supporting this talk and uh, helping advertise this talk. We have Bridget Scanlon here from UT Austin, Jackson School of Geosciences. I'm really excited because uh, I've known Bridget for a while. She does some great work uh, using GRACE and many other techniques. Uh, Well-respected hydrologist, National Academies member, Bridget. And uh, really what I lo love about Bridget's work is that she really embraces uh, many different techniques and has really been um, an advocate of building a bridge between what we do in the scientific community and stakeholders as well and led some very interesting work uh, working with groundwater managers uh, in different parts of the country and really understanding that perspective as well. So uh, without any further hesitation, please welcome Bridget Scanlon uh, to talk about her work. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Sure. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, the opportunity uh, to give this presentation. And um, I'm going to talk about uh, Grace data and its impacts on water resources management, uh, but probably more broadly than that. And I would like to acknowledge the people that are working with me at the moment, uh, Ashraf Rateb, uh, Alex Sun, and Timan Chusave from uh, Center for Space uh, Research. Um, I'm very grateful for having the Grace satellite data and, uh, you know, really enjoy working with it and using it in various uh, aspects. Uh, so, I have benefited, I, this morning I spoke with uh, Petra Dahl, who is uh, the author of Water Gap Global Model, and uh, we're preparing for a podcast, and she said I'm a knowledge integrator, <laughs> and I feel somewhat similar, I don't really, uh, and so just providing data, but I benefited hugely from postdocs in our group over the years, and, uh, and um, like to acknowledge them from various places, and they're all doing really well now, and also, being at the University of Texas at Austin from Himanshu and Jen Li Chen and, and uh, Professor Wilson, and then also folks here, uh, David and uh, uh, Felix. Um, uh, and then we oftentimes comparing, using GRACE for hydrology and working with various hydrologists over the years and uh, trying to link NASA with the US Geological Survey and um, other groups that, that has been interesting. And then also compare GRACE uh, data with uh, global hydrologic models and so interactive with the uh, various modelers um, an unfunded mandate, which seems to be the most interesting work I find I do most of the time. It's never the funded stuff usually. Um, so um, some take home messages that I feel from from the work that I've been doing over the years. Um, it seems from GRACE, uh, their uh, GRACE satellite data on water storage changes uh, that we seem to jump to the component storages like soil moisture or groundwater things and not truly um, discussing the terrestrial water storage, the total water storage and giving it e uh, a lot of weight. And I think it's important to first uh, evaluate in detail uh, changes in terrestrial water storage without immediately uh, trying to determine where the storage change is occurring vertically in the profile. Uh, so I think that's an important aspect. And uh, then we need to understand the causes of these water storage changes if we're going to develop appropriate solutions. And so we often think about climate uh, uh, drivers, um, uh, wet and dry climate cycles and uh, atmospheric rivers in California and other things. And then also human intervention and groundwater pumpage, or sometimes it's a combination of both. But if we are going to manage water resources, we need to understand what's causing the changes, and I'll be talking about some of that. Also, even though uh, GRACE data is over the two decades now, and that's fantastic, uh, uh, but also putting it in the longer term context, uh, which I think uh, uh, British Geological Survey did recently with the Indo-Gangetic Basin, I think that's nice looking back in time uh, to the early 1900s and seeing what the changes were over much longer time scales than GRACE and putting the GRACE data in context. Um, and then lastly, I think it's important for us to look as many, at as many different approaches as possible. And JT and I were talking this morning about various satellite data, uh, GPS, uh, SWAT, and, um, uh, and, and then trying to combine these uh, and 
as more data become available and more models and stuff for data analytics, uh, we won't have the luxury of just looking at one thing because reviewers will say, well, did you look at such and such, you know? So um, it would be more and more important to, to consider uh, various things. So this is uh, an outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, uh, first, provide some background information and then talk about uh, comparison of GRACE data with global models, a study we did uh, several years ago, and then uh, talk about uh, the causes of water storage changes, uh, climate and humans, and where those storage changes were occurring in the profile, and then the impacts on water policy and uh, then operational application with drought and floods and things like that and uh, uh, where the future may lay. So you're all familiar with these slides, uh, this slide, you know, with the Gray Satellite data. I think what was interesting to me was that uh, it was launched on St. Patrick's Day uh, in um, 2002. And I think there was another satellite that was launched on March 17th, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, so I'm here for a review board meeting for the, the mass change mission and uh, it's interesting uh, how many aspects of the, the new mission are similar to the original mission uh, with the elevation 500 kilometers. Uh, hydrologists, uh, and this of course affects the spatial resolution of the GRACE data, and hydrologists keep asking, you know, well could we get, you know, 50 kilometers or whatever and um, I feel like they're the parent that always wants the child to do whatever it's not good at. <laughs> and so I think it's important to, to take grace and take it as the big picture as JFM Yeti emphasized in one of his papers many years ago. Um, and so for sea level rise, for large changes, and then uh, it's a very valuable and time series. And uh, I think it's great that uh, terrestrial total water storage uh, was recognized as an essential climate variable um, last year. And so I think we need to consider total water storage um, much more than we have in the past and not always just say it's groundwater or it's surface water or whatever, because having that net uh, water storage is a very valuable, which we've seen for the, the Mississippi and I'll talk about that later. I don't know if many of you were around uh, when the 60 Minutes uh, uh, show aired uh, in uh, 2014, in November 2014, when Leslie Stahl was talking to Mike Watkins and discussing GRACE data. And what I liked about this 60 Minutes series was that they gave equal emphasis to the satellite data and to the ground-based monitoring with uh, Claudia Font measuring water levels in wells uh, at the bottom. And so I thought it was a very balanced uh, program uh, because usually we just hear one side of the thing and uh, very rarely that they integrate uh, both aspects. And, um, you know, we're so accustomed now to global maps of this and that, you know, but uh, if we didn't have satellite data to prov and global models, we wouldn't have these global pictures. And it's not so long ago that we didn't have that. And if we were trying to develop uh, global groundwater storage changes from the monitoring data, it would be impossible, as you can see from this uh, IGRAC, International Groundwater Resources Assessment Center, the data that they have. I mean, some countries don't share data or some countries don't collect data. And so it's uh, fantastic uh, to have uh, some ideas of what's going on in various regions globally. Um, and then uh, there's also issues if you're trying to develop uh, water storage, uh, groundwater storage from uh, lower level looking at well data, uh, it's very difficult to convert a water level change to a volume because of uncertainties in the storage coefficients. I mean, if it's a shallow unconfined aquifer, the storage coefficient might be 0.1. So one meter water level might be 0.1 meter uh, water equivalent height. Uh, but if it's a confined aquifer, like you have deep aquifers in the Central Valley below the Corcoran Clay or things like that, then it could be uh, 0 0.0001 because the storage coefficients can uh, vary so markedly between shallow unconfined and deep confined aquifers. And some wells can um, go across both uh, systems. So very difficult uh, to go to a regional water storage from well data. So um, 
Himanshu Savvy at Center for Space Research said he was really tired of people saying that the gray state is so uncertain and, you know, so large scale. So he said, I feel like that the global models are very uncertain and so we should do an analysis of that. This was, of course, not funded. Um, but uh, we uh, did look at uh, the uh, gray state and compared them with the uh, uh, global models. And at the time we did this analysis, there were two basic types of models, the global hydrologic models uh, that were really developed to evaluate water scarcity. And uh, these are water budget models, essentially, uh, that include um, recharge and human water use and reservoir management. And uh, then the other type was land surface models um, that are, were generally developed to provide the lower boundary condition for global climate models. And so these are generally more physically uh, based, uh, but uh, don't include a lot of the management aspects like surface water management or um, human water use uh, or reservoir management. So, and now there are many more different types of models or they've modified these types of models and hybrid type models. But at the time we did this analysis, these were the two main types of models. And so we looked at uh, GRACE uh, total water storage trends uh, and compared them then with the modeled total water storage trends uh, based on data from 2002 through 2014. And uh, the blue areas uh, show uh, where we have increases in storage like the Amazon, the Okavanga, um, and, um, and then the red areas are where we have declines in storage like the Tigris Euphrates, the Ganges, uh, the High River Basin. Um, and uh, then we compared those then with uh, various uh, water storage changes from um, uh, different river basins. And so, for example, in the Mississippi, then uh, the um, First, uh, I'm not sure if this is, which one is the pointer, the top one? The one on the top. Okay. Oh, yeah, right. So the Mississippi River Basin, these are the trends in water storage over 2002 through 2014 in cubic kilometers per year. And so you see GRACE data from three processing centers, CSR, JPL, and GSFC. And uh, they each use uh, their own approaches. And that's actually a good thing because it's very difficult for them or impossible for them to validate the data. And so having different approaches from the different centers is good. So for the Mississippi, then you can see uh, CSR and JPL are similar, but GSFC is much lower. Then the global hydrologic models, water gap and PCR, they are very different from each other in terms of trends. Um, uh, water gap uh, showing a declining trend and PCR showing a rising trend. And the land surface models then are uh, NOAA, uh, Mosaic, Vic, and CLM. And you can see uh, declines in storage, um, the largest in Mosaic, uh, uh, and uh, a rise in CLM4. So you can see that the models are all over the map. So Himanshu was very happy um, <laughs> with this result. But there's also some uncertainty among the GRACE uh, processing centers. And so that's important uh, to acknowledge also. So if we look at the Amazon, then the Amazon's a large basin, 6 million square kilometers. And you can see uh, consistent results among the three processing centers because the 40F GRACE is the large uh, basin size. And uh, then you can see that uh, very large differences between the global hydrologic models, water gap almost zero, and PCR much lower. And then a lot of differences among the land surface models. Um, so, I mean, because GRACE uh, gets the big picture, then I think it's the uh, most appropriate to, to look at uh, the GRACE data uh, for uh, large basins. Um, so the Okavanga region then, that's an internally drained basin, and you can see, you know, large increases in storage over this uh, time from GRACE, and then almost uh, no change in storage from most of the models. Um, and any idea why that would be? Uh, Okavanga is an internally drained basin. So when you have increases in precipitation, the water storage builds up, but most of the models simulate all that runoff as leaving the basin and going to the ocean. So the models weren't uh, uh, simulating the appropriate processes. Um, the high river basin, North China Plain, uh, declines in storage related to irrigated agriculture. And here's the only place we found that the, the global hydrologic models overestimated the declines in storage. 
the land surface models because they don't simulate the human water use didn't uh, capture uh, that. And then lastly, uh, the Ganges Basin declines in storage related to irrigation. And then again, a lot of variability among the models. So most of the models underestimated the trends in water storage relative to grace. And this is not something that you would think of a priori because you would think of grace data being kind of smeared out over a large area. Uh, but uh, that was uh, the result in only in one or two cases did we find that the models overestimated the trends. But remember that the trends is the smallest part of the signal. It's a, maybe at most 10% of the signal and the signal is dominated by seasonal variations. And so, but most of the interest uh, uh, with hydrologists and stuff is in the long-term trends. So uh, now looking at uh, the uh, causes of uh, total water storage changes uh, and where it's occurring. Is it in the surface water, soil moisture, or groundwater? And then is it uh, climate? Uh, in which case, if it's climate and just droughts and floods, maybe we need to adapt to those uh, climate extremes. If it's groundwater pumpage, excessive groundwater pumpage, we need to maybe reduce the pumpage. Um, or if it's both, we need to figure out what the relative importance are. And then what the impacts that has had on water policy. Um, so, um, uh, I really like the images that NASA develops, they're very helpful. <laughs> And so this is the uh, total water storage changes over time. And here they're looking at uh, uh, the Okavanga region. And so large increases in storage in the Okavanga related to a wet period and uh, then uh, declines in storage during. Uh, so that was related to precipitation increases over that uh, time around 2011-12 and then declines in storage rel uh, related to more recent drought uh, conditions. And um, so that's natural variability because there's very little irrigation or human water use there. Uh, and then in Saudi Arabia, then large declines in storage um, uh, related to irrigated agriculture. And so here you can see 91 irrigation circles, 2000 and 2012, huge expansion of irrigated agriculture over this time and declines in groundwater storage. And then maybe a more leveling off uh, in recent years uh, with a change in policy uh, to reduce irrigated agriculture. Um, so I really like uh, Matt Rodell's uh, paper in 2018 um, on looking at uh, water storage changes between 2002 and 16 and uh, attributing them to different uh, causes. And he main causes are climate change in uh, red and purple and that's uh, shown by uh, the arrows from the different regions. So climate uh, change uh, in Greenland and, Antar uh, and Antarctica and um, Alaska regions, uh, areas like that. And uh, then um, the orange is probable direct human impact. Uh, and, um, uh, and then the yellow is po possible or partial direct human impact. And then the green is natural variability. So you can see in most of sub-Saharan Africa, uh, all of the leaders are green, so it's mostly natural variability because they're not using much water, there's very little irrigation, and so they're really just responding to climate cycles like uh, ENSO and other climate cycles. In North Africa, there's a lot of irrigation, and so that's a partial or direct human impact there. Central Valley, uh, possible or partial direct human impact. I think I maybe... Uh, I don't know, it's a combination of droughts and uh, human uh, use. And then uh, Southern High Plains is a drought, um, partial direct human impact. I'd say that's more direct human impact. <laughs> uh, but um, in this Northern region here, um, when you're recovering from a drought, then you see an increase in storage going from a dry to wet period. And also in the Murray Darling Basin going from dry to wet. Um, and then Middle East, a lot of declines in storage related to over abstraction of groundwater and then an increase in the Three Gorges area with, with the filling of the Three Gorges Dam. So very nice analysis and very comprehensive. Uh, and uh, uh, I think the first time really we saw the range of attribution across different uh, causes. I think it was um, uh, really nice. So. Um, 
Ashraf Ratib in our group uh, looked at uh, the trends in water storage uh, 2002 uh, through September 21. And um, following on a study that Vishwakarma did, um, saying that we should look at the trends relative to interannual variability. And so if the trends were greater than three standard deviations of interannual variability, then it's um, dotted a line. And if it's less than then, there's no hash ring. So the only, in most of the areas where we have large trends like the Southwest and South Central US and large increases in the Northeast, um, and this is um, uh, the only area that we really see no hash ring is this Okavanga region uh, where uh, the uh, trends are uh, less than three standard deviations of interannual variability. Um, and they're similar to what Matt had shown earlier. So looking at the time series then, so most of you are familiar with the Central Valley. So you can see we have a lot of interannual variability in the Central Valley, uh, but a net declining trend, which we've seen since the 1900s, because the recovery is never enough uh, to, uh, uh, to, we only partially recover from the droughts uh, because the pumping is so much greater. Um, and uh, the St. Lawrence then, um, Donna Dargis did a very nice analysis of this joint, the increase in storage in the Great Lakes and the surrounding land area uh, related to, to climate uh, in that region. Uh, in South America, you know, uh, lar uh, some large interannual variability in the Paranaiba and the Garani aquifer and uh, different phases related to wet and dry climate cycles. And Jan Lee Chen has published a fair bit on that. Middle East and North Africa, just a one-way street, uh, monotonic changes in storage for the most part. Uh, the red is the Euphrates, and you can see uh, the 2007 drought, and then it stayed dry for a long time, and then atmospheric rivers in 2019, and, and you can see some recovery from that. Uh, but Iran has uh, large declines in storage, and uh, the Nubian aquifer, uh, slight declines in storage. It's a huge aquifer. Um, these are all at the same scale, so the biggest changes in storage were in the Ganges Brahmaputra region, and so you can see large declines in storage over time, much greater than the interannual variability um, and, the Indus and the North China Plain uh, declines in storage. And now they have the south to north transfer, so it's less. And uh, in Australia, uh, the GRACE data started monitoring during the millennium drought. And so we were, uh, the storage changes uh, were already low. And then you had the recovery during 2010, 2011, related to, to um, La Nina conditions, and then back down into drought again. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, we saw earlier the Upper Kalahari uh, wet uh, increases during a wet uh, period, and then declines after that, and then gradual changes in some of these aquifers, like Niger and Ogaden Juba, attributed to land use change um, and increasing recharge related to land use change and uh, agriculture. Um, so uh, the gray data are great for the last uh, couple of decades, uh, but then putting it in a longer term context, then the British Geological Survey recently published uh, uh, this study of uh, groundwater uh, accumulation in Northwest India and Pakistan from uh, groundwater level data that they collated from various offices in the region and working with the government agencies and uh, also mapping uh, the canal system in Northwest India. So you can see from the early 1900s, uh, they were building large canals. The British had a big integrated canal system for irrigation that continued to expand over time over the last century. And then if you look at uh, the uh, water volume over that time, you can see a net increase of about, or I mean an increase of about 450 cubic kilometers uh, through the uh, mid to, to late 1900s, sort of plateauing here. And then more recently declines in storage with increasing uh, groundwater pumpage. So here you can see the canal system expanding. So surface water irrigation, recharging the aquifers, and these are huge alluvial aquifers, and increase in storage. And then only in the last few decades, then they have increases in um, pumping or um, drilling of groundwater wells, tube wells for pumping for irrigation, because the, the landowners had more ready access to, to it for irrigation. 
so there's uh, been probably a net increase of about uh, 250 cubic kilometers over that time. Um, so, and uh, the increase in storage early on occurred even though they were, it was a pretty dry period uh, because of surface water. I was one time at a, a meeting with ERCOT, which is our electricity reliability group, and uh, the guy was sitting next to me and he said he had to, to go home and uh, turn on his irrigation system so he could recharge the aquifer. And, uh, you know, at first I was kind of like um, just sm smiling. And, but then, I mean, uh, he had a surface water. We were, Austin uses a lot of surface water. So if he really wanted to do that, he was doing it because, I mean, uh, it was fed by surface water. And surface water irrigation uh, increases recharging groundwater. Um, and then uh, the World Bank recently released a report, um, Hidden Wealth of Nations, the Economics of Groundwater in Times of Climate Change. And they have this uh, GRACE uh, map. And uh, you can see the red areas are where you have a high probability of depletion, Saudi Arabia, Middle East, and uh, into a Gangetic Basin. And uh, uh, the hazard areas are for seasonal deficits and uh, decrease here also. Um, but I was surprised in the report, they didn't mention the huge increase in the Indo-Gangetic Basin since 1900s. And they worked with the British Geological Survey in developing this report. I mean, it's so important uh, to consider the long-term context. Um, and so I'm probably going to be talking to them in the near future. So one of the big questions is where is the storage change occurring? Is it in the soil moisture? Is it in the groundwater? Uh, or is it in both? And so in this um, Euphrates Basin here, we show uh, the uh, gray state in black and the uncertainty in gray. And so you can see the decline in 2007 to 2009. And these are the global models that all <coughs> underestimated the decline in storage. Uh, so one of the earliest papers by Voss uh, attributed the decline to groundwater pumpage. Um, so all of the decline to groundwater pumpage, then a long look, Laurent Lungvern uh, said it was all reservoir storage because there are a lot of surface reservoirs in the um, Euphrates Basin. And so he was using altimetry and said he could attribute most of the change with forward modeling and what Grace would see. And uh, then uh, another study uh, by Mulder uh, attributed it to mostly surface reservoir storage declines, but natural groundwater depletion uh, linked to the drought. Uh, and so it just, uh, with the time, you know, people look at the, the data in more detail and so our thinking evolves. Uh, but oftentimes the psychology of it is that the first study out is gospel and we never change our minds and we keep referencing uh, the first study. But anyway, um, so another study, there's a lot of interest these days in the Colorado River Basin and uh, uh, what's going on there. And uh, an early study suggested that it was uh, groundwater depletion during drought threatens future water security of the Colorado River Basin, attributed most of it uh, to uh, groundwater pumpage. And uh, then uh, we did a study then with the USGS and showed that the upper Colorado River Basin in, in this region is using very little groundwater. Uh, but, uh, and so it's mostly snow and soil moisture. And the lower basin, in, uh, which is mostly Arizona, is using some groundwater, but it's um, surface water, soil moisture, and groundwater all contribute uh, to depletion. Uh, so uh, it's important to, to consider that. And now uh, they are uh, going to have a decline in this, um, an allocation of three million acre feet, which is approximately three cubic kilometers over the next uh, three years, 2024 to 2026. And um, California's senior water rights, so uh, the decline that it will um, have to deal with is much less than in Arizona. Uh, and so what will they, uh, you know, how will they manage this decline? Um, so they've been storing a lot of water in Arizona. They built the Central Arizona project, uh, the cap uh, to move water from the Colorado to Phoenix and Tucson. And they stored the water in the um, active management areas in the uh, spreading basins. Um, and uh, also they moved from irrigating with groundwater to irrigating with surface water. 
as I mentioned earlier, when you irrigate with surface water, uh, inefficient surface water irrigation recharges groundwater. Um, and so all of those things, so they've been banking water for the last uh, 10, 15 years. And so now they will be testing it, I think, to see what they can get back. And what they will be able to do, they will, you know, trigger subsidence or things like that. So it will be interesting to, to watch. So Ashraf Rateb and others, we did this analysis of water storage trends in the aquifers um, throughout the U.S. because we have some data in the U.S. We're not a developing country, I don't think so. We thought it would be best to do a detailed analysis <laughs> of the U.S. And uh, so here are total water storage trends 2002 through 2017. And you can see the California, the southern part is minus 22 cubic kilometers over the 15 year time period. Uh, Arizona decline, uh, central and southern high plains. But what was surprising, an increase in the northern high plains in Nebraska. Most people think of the high plains aquifer as a, a one size fits all, it's all one story, but really the northern high plains uh, hasn't uh, been declining in storage. And then um, no change in these yellow areas, the upper Colorado, the Mississippi, uh, Idaho, and uh, rises in storage in the humid regions in the east and, uh, the, uh, and in Washington state. Uh, so subtracting soil moisture, then you get similar trends in groundwater storage um, in these uh, aquifers. And uh, USGS had done an analysis of these uh, basins, and Lenny Conoco had published this data. The time periods are different. We have 2 to 17, but he had uh, 2002, uh, 2000 to 2008. So what do you think? Do you think these are very similar? Do you think... They are very different, or what do you think? And where are they different? The northern high plains, yeah. The Mississippi? Mississippi, yeah. Um, so, huge difference in the Mississippi. I mean, Grace is saying there's no decline in storage. And the regional groundwater model in the Mississippi is saying it's declining by minus 60 uh, cubic kilometers over that um, eight year period. Um, so who's right? And how do we figure it out? <laughs> uh, so this Powell group, it's NSF funded. Uh, it includes uh, NASA, uh, David Weiss and him, uh, Manjo Savi and others, and it includes USGS. Um, and some academic people. So it was really nice to have everybody. We had a meeting every summer for a week and one day off during the week to just uh, uh, chat. And um, so the USGS agreed that they thought that the GRACE data were correct and they uh, and they've been revising the regional model. And uh, so now uh, this is the results from the most recent model from uh, the last 10 year period. So their original model had, uh, did not have a detailed surface water system uh, in it. It was a very crude uh, representation of surface water. And so they were missing recharge uh, from stream leakage and underestimating recharge. And so now they're showing groundwater storage decline of um, uh, almost uh, z uh, z zero over the past 10 years. So they acknowledged that their regional model was incorrect, it underestimated uh, stream leakage and that surface water groundwater connection. So when you pump groundwater, uh, it can come from aquifer storage or it can capture surface water and reduce groundwater discharge to surface water or it could reduce evapotranspiration if you deepen the water table. So Lenny Conoco says that most of the groundwater pumpage in the US 85% comes from capture, and only 15% comes from storage, aquifer storage. And when In Inga de Graaf ran her PCR global model with and without capture, she found similar percentages. 15% from storage, 85% from capture globally. I mean, that's not gospel, but I mean, it's just, it's just important to, to consider where the water is coming from. And um, so now just look at a, a couple of examples of uh, climate and human water use and the impacts on uh, grace water storage. And most of you 
uh, very familiar with the, the Central Valley. So this is the uh, San Joaquin Tulare Basin. So you can see uh, declines in storage 2007 to 2009 drought, slight increase during 10 and 11, and then the very extreme drought, uh, and then some recovery. And then this is the US uh, drought monitor. And I, I just really love this, you know, uh, US drought monitor, the drought stops overnight when you get to the atmospheric rivers in 2017. And you had the same thing uh, this year, um, you know, uh, which was interesting. And uh, so the correlation then between the US drought monitor data and total water storage is 0.91. So it would suggest that it's uh, that the climate is a strong driving force on total water storage changes. So that's uh, Central Valley, just so a couple of other examples. So this is uh, the Northern High Plains. Uh, so you can see declines during drought and some recovery in between, and then a flash drought in 2012. And uh, then in the central and southern high plains, it's almost a monotonic decline uh, because we're always pumping more than we recharge, but then that's amplified during the drought in 2011. And uh, then the drought intensity is much less in the humid eastern US when you look at the US drought monitor. And so here you can see a Mississippi embayment regional aquifer just increasing and decreasing with uh, wet and dry periods, uh, but no overall trend in storage. So that was the climate and the relationship with climate and the correlations there range from 0.5 in the central and southern high plains uh, to 0.9 in, in the central valley. So looking at uh, human water use, and of course, irrigation is the elephant in the room in terms of human water use. Um, and so you can see irrigated agriculture in the Central Valley, Snake River Plain, the Cascades, and uh, the High Plains region, and to Mississippi. Uh, and so if we look at the, the Central Valley, the San Joaquin Tulare, so 2010 was a wet year, and uh, these bars indicate that the light blue is surface water irrigation, the dark blue is uh, groundwater, and gray is other. So this is data from the USGS. So during a wet period, we use mostly surface water. When you use surface water, it recharges groundwater, and you're using less groundwater. Uh, in, during the drought in 2015, the extreme drought, um, the demand didn't increase because they didn't have the water. Uh, but surface water is now about 30% of the total, and you're pumping groundwater. So you're missing that recharge from surface water, and you're pumping directly from the aquifer. And so that amplifies the depletion. So it wasn't just the, the switching from wet to dry climate cycles. It's also the change in the source of water for irrigation amplifying the impacts of climate. Just show one more example, then uh, Mississippi embayment. They actually pump more groundwater in this region, which is surprising, was surprising to me. Um, and, uh, but the, and they use very little surface water. But in this humid region, then, that groundwater is uh, capturing surface water. Um, and so uh, World Wildlife Foundation had an article where they were saying, maybe we should move the ag from Central Valley to Mississippi, uh, where they had the water to support it. Uh, but they said there are a lot more issues with agriculture and food production. Um, you have the migrant labor force here in, in the Central Valley. You have uh, high solar energy, good soils, and you can apply the water when you need it. You have much lower pests. Uh, so there are a lot of other factors to consider with food production, uh, and uh, water is just one of them. So I think, um, you know, Grace had a big part to play in, in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and uh, uh, these uh, uh, visuals uh, showing the changes in total water storage um, you really captured the public's uh, and, and the, the regulators in California and I think uh, really helped with the passing of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act in 2014. Um, so you can see the, the, the huge drought, um, uh, very intense drought um, and, and the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act was passed in, uh, during that time period. Um, so I, I think some people, I've been in meetings where people said, well, we could never monitor groundwater before we had grace. And the poor USGS don't get any credit for all the work they were doing for the past hundred years. So Sigma uh, groundwater <coughs> sustainability plans and um, in high priority and critically overdrafted basins. So I think about 100 
115 overdrafted basins are the, they need to develop sustainable uh, management approaches. And these uh, groundwater basins are pretty small. And I think there would be a lot of double and triple accounting where one base, small basin would be counting this and then another one would be. And so there would probably need to be more integration. And, um, but it's a bottom up plan, which we have in Texas also. Uh, but, but I think um, uh, the state has the hammer then to, to kind of uh, approve or not approve. Uh, so, in the um, a lot of newspaper articles in Northwest India, and when Gra NASA did those uh, studies of when Mac published his paper in 2009, there was a lot of um, uh, publications on groundwater depletion. And so, what are they doing now? So, the government, uh, with the aid from the World Bank, uh, so in some regions, switching from groundwater wells back to irrigation canals. Punjab, uh, also incentivizing farmers to reduce groundwater, and some cities in Punjab moving from groundwater to canals. Um, so I think that's important. This conjunctive use, where you have access to both groundwater and surface water, is to use them both conjunctively and use the uh, surface water during wet periods and uh, uh, maintain the groundwater as a buffer. So the United Nations uh, this past year um, uh, their emphasis was on groundwater, making the invisible visible, and I think Grace plays a huge role uh, in that, and um, it's uh, wonderful. And then the fact sheet on World Water Day, um, uh, very nicely um, discussing groundwater, making the invisible visible. So Grace Satellite's huge um, contribution in that, along with geophysics and all other types of approaches, modeling. So I'll just briefly talk about operational applications and future. So uh, Himanshu Savi has been developing uh, a five-day grace solution. And so these are the ground tracks. So it gets global coverage with a five-day solution. And then using that then to look at uh, floods. And Ashraf Rajab has been looking at flooding. So you can see uh, the red is the five-day solution. And the blue is the monthly solution. And this is flooding in Myanmar in 2015. And uh, the, um, this is the discharge in the, the river. And uh, this is the Dartmouth Flood Observatory showing when the flood was. So the monthly data doesn't capture it, but the, the five-day uh, solution does. And it has about a, a five-day uh, latency. And so this is um, uh, very nicely shows the value of that. And uh, oh, um, so, yeah. Um, Oh, yeah. So I really like these images that NASA have because um, I love. Uh, so that shows the flooding uh, in the Irrawaddy. Um, uh, and sometimes, you know, uh, because I don't have a life, I, I look at these over the weekends and it's just like candy. You know, it's just <laughs> really cool that you guys put these develop together, these stories and stuff. Um, so the mass change uh, hasn't. Um, baseline concept is very similar to GRACE and GRACE follow-on and um, the launch date, proposed launch date is May 2028. Um, um, you want my recommendation? That will be my recommendation. Um, and so most of you are very familiar with the, this, uh, uh, the laser ranging interferometer is now standard uh, instrumentation and uh, uh, accelerometer. Um, uh, and uh, let's see, maybe I missed. Um, and so the, the measurements then should be consistent with the GRACE follow-on. It would be great if there's going to be an overlap period and then you'll have more higher temporal resolution data if both uh, will operate at the same time. So I think in future, you know, with all of the, the, the new satellites that are coming up, I mean, GRACE, uh, SMAP, altimetry, SWAT, uh, uh, GPS, uh, um, all of these different satellites, and uh, then the different types of modeling, both regional and global modeling. Um, and we can't forget in situ monitoring groundwater levels and reservoirs, uh, trying to bring all of this together and trying to understand what's going on in different regions would be more important, uh, more and more important in the future using data analytics and uh, uncertainty quantification, I think would be very important. Um, so this is the group at the Powell Research, um, one of these meetings and uh, 
uh, we legitimately had a day after in the middle of the week. And normally I just think, oh, just short circuit that and just uh, get on with it. Uh, but actually, it's really important, I think, uh, for people from different fields to have time to, to relax and, and so face to face and uh, these sorts of things. Um, uh, and uh, then, uh, because nobody reads papers that I write, so I've started to do a podcast and nobody's listening to that either. Um, but um, I really enjoyed it, and uh, it was very nice to uh, talk to Mike Dettinger about atmospheric rivers. And um, we recorded the first one last November, but then you had all that slew of atmospheric rivers in December and January, so we had to re-record. And um, when people are explaining things um, in a podcast without the crutch of PowerPoint, they explain, I feel like they explain things more clearly. And uh, then we put together the highlights with it and stuff like that. So it's not, uh, um, uh, I'm pro probably, my daughter says I'll be canceled any day, but I mean, uh, <laughs> it's just, uh, I I'm learning a lot and really enjoying it. And I appreciate all of these people taking the time uh, to do it. So to summarize then, I think we're continually improving GRACE uh, products and integrating it with other satellite data. And I think we should uh, pay more emphasis on total water storage without immediately jumping to whether it's surface water, soil moisture, or groundwater. And uh, then uh, total water storage is now incorporated into these model intercomparison projects. They're calculating it and comparing with the easy MIP model intercomparison project. Um, and uh, I think, uh, you know, the visual and, and the data that GRACE provides uh, for hydrology is really having an impact on policies. Um, you see the World Bank using it, you see uh, the uh, California DWR and other groups. And I think uh, uh, higher frequency, shorter term solutions with low latency would also help with uh, some uh, monitoring. Um, so. I would be uh, glad to, to answer any questions. Thanks uh, for coming. I have a question. Um, Really interesting talk. Thank you very much for coming here. Um, in the con you didn't mention anything about crop type, so I'm wondering if the um, the correspondence of a drought index, for example, with the terrestrial water storage change, does that have some sensitivity to whether or not the sector is dominated by annual versus perennial crops? And I ask the question because in California, of course, we have a lot of perennial crops and so the options to fallow land for example are pretty minimal when we have a significant drought and therefore a lot more groundwater is pumped um, that makes those two indices very um, strongly correlated with one another um, right. Deb, is that something that you've looked into at all um i haven't uh looked into it directly but i'm aware of it uh, you know the 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 switch uh, from annual to uh, perennial crops uh, i mean way back when probably before you know <laughs> uh, we looked at uh, changing from native vegetation in the high plains uh, to cropland um, and so we went from deep-rooted grasses and shrubs uh, to short-rooted uh, crops that had uh, that were grown seasonally and they had uh, uh, you know in the winter there was nothing bare soil and so we saw a big increase in in recharge related to that and they've seen it in west africa they've seen it in australia they see it uh, there's a new article i think coming out in science next week about flooding in argentina uh, related to that uh, agricultural expansion and shallowing water tables and flooding uh, so uh, we've seen that, but then uh, where I was interested also, they were promoting biofuels and um, next generation biofuels, which would be switchgrass and uh, miscanthus, which are deep rooted grasses. And so if they change from corn or some other crops back to those deep rooted grasses, they would reduce the recharge, reduce the base flow to streams in the Midwest and things like that. So it's a very important thing. But 
when I was talking to Megan Corner in the uh, podcast, and she said one of the reasons there was a book, I think, even about uh, the reason people like to grow alfalfa is that they can have five or six cuttings a year and they can maximize the economics. And so if it's dry, they don't have to grow it at that particular time of the year. So that gives them a lot of flexibility. Uh, but that's considered a low value uh, crop, but they like the flexibility. So, I mean, you know, there's so many factors, economics, uh, social hydrology, uh, you know, whether they grow almonds or uh, perennial um, trees and things like that. So that's very um, vineyards and all of those sorts of things. Um, you lose that flexibility. I'm not sure I answered your question. No, I think you did. Thank you. Uh, online. We have an online question that I could ask quickly. Uh, Bridget, it, the question is uh, from Ted, when a basin is depleting, but there is no or little pumping activity, what is the cause? Is there a natural means of drainage? Right, so when we did the study in the Colorado River Basin and the upper Colorado Basin River Basin, we know there's very little groundwater pumpage from the USGS data. Um, but more recent work by the USGS is looking at uh, base flow, uh, how much groundwater is discharging to streams. And during drought, then uh, there is natural depletion of groundwater um, because of uh, plants um, evapotranspiring more and uh, uh, reduced rainfall, reduced recharge. So it can happen naturally. Also, that uh, decline um, linked to, to uh, groundwater and surface water evaporation and soil moisture. Um, so, um, I think uh, there is natural depletion. And when we looked at uh, when uh, Mulder published this stuff in the Euphrates, say, attributed the, the declines in storage there to mostly to reservoir storage, but natural groundwater depletion because they said there wasn't that much pumpage. And that would be deepening of the, the, the water tables and evapotranspiration, uh, removing the storage. Hey, hi, Bridget. Hey, thanks. That was very interesting. So I was ask you to uh, comment on something, and that is, there's a, uh, I don't know, a push in the community, the, the space community, to launch a second pair of Grace-like satellites in an inclined orbit, with the goal of improving the the horizontal resolution by some fifteen or twenty percent. Uh, and that would be in a pair in an inclined orbit. Another option would be to put it in a polar orbit, which would increase the temporal resolution, take it from 30 days to 15 days, because you would get twice as, you know, get the gravity field, you know, twice as often. My question is, I just wonder if you could comment on which you think would be more valuable, greater temporal resolution or some slight improvement in horizontal resolution? I know I'm leading the witness here. Um. I mean, I think, you know, you said 20% uh, change in the horizontal resolution or uh, and then going from 30 to, to 15 day. But I think you have other ways to, to uh, increase uh, the temporal resolution uh, by using maybe uh, level one or quick look and um, um, uh, approaches with the processing that you could achieve. Uh, you know, I mean, it would be nice. Um, and as far as you know, 20% improvement in um, spatial resolution, the hydrologists still won't be happy. You know, they, they would like 50 kilometers or, you know. Um, and so... So, 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 if, like, let's say the 30 days and stuff, you know, quick looks or processing to get down to, say, 15, and then you have two pairs you can get down to seven. Is there value among the user community in having greater temporal resolution? Well, I mean, I think it would be nice to have greater temporal resolution. And I mean, uh, JT's uh, work on flooding and stuff. I mean, I think it would be, you know, droughts uh, generally happen gradually. I know we have flash droughts, but, you know, we have some time to see them or whatever. So I, I don't think increased temporal resolution is really critical for droughts. But for flooding, 
you know, increased temporal resolution would be valuable. And uh, I think if it's um, if it's a case of you know increasing the spatial resolution versus uh, of 20 by 20 percent versus temporal resolution, I think I would go for the temporal resolution and flooding. Because really, it's uh, very important for us these days to manage these extremes. And you know, the Corps of Engineers is looking at forecast informed reservoir operations and, and trying to um, optimize uh, so we don't release water if we can hold on to it or you know, we move it into storage and things like that. So, flooding, I think, is, is a huge, huge issue. And um, if you can get better data. And to to address flood vulnerability and you know is the system primed you know and and then also even that that also gets into drought recovery which is a huge issue you know we're getting this rain it looks like it's normal why are we, the reservoirs filling you know is the soil moisture what's the storage you know do we have a huge deficit that we need to uh, um, fill before we can see runoff into the reservoirs so I would go for the temporal. But, yeah, I, but they probably won't. I, I, I agree. I think, uh, I think we, we've discussed about, uh, been thinking about uh, drought and groundwater benefiting from higher spatial resolution, with flood really benefiting from higher temporal resolution. And uh, we, have a, we have a paper that's in review now where we try to independently characterize the typical size and duration of flood and drought events globally, and then say, well, how many more do we capture? How many more events do we capture? Given enhanced spatial or temporal resolution, theoretically, and uh, maybe maybe those numbers will result in prioritizing, uh, being able to prioritize some, some observational strategy. I'd like to ask your opinion on something. Uh, in the, in some of the conversations we've had with folks here, folks at DWR in California, the information that we get from Grace, they say, where we mapping kind of aquifer level trends. They'll say it's not useful for management. Management decisions are not made at that resolution, they say. And it seems, so, so it seems like with Grace, the opportunity is really maybe at the policy level, not the management, operational management level. Um, you, like, you, like you said, in, uh, in California, in India, uh, Faisal Hossein has some work in Pakistan where, they, where they've implemented some policy changes on groundwater pumping. What do you think about the, the where to insert the information from from Grace Grace follow on so, decision making. So, so they may say that you know it's too large scale to 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 use it for management, but actually, I mean, it is large scale. But if it but if it's the same at small scale, then the scale is, is sort of scale independent. I mean, if you know the large scale is is sort of uh, reflecting the smaller scale, then I think it is important for management. And you know, if somebody says to me, "Oh, the Murray Darling Basin," you know, they're in drought. Out again, my first thing is to look at the time series of grace, you know, and just see where is the storage. It's, I, I really like that total water storage to see where is it at. You know, I don't want, you know, what's the model saying about soil moisture, or, you know, or things like that. I just like to know where we are. Uh, and uh, this morning, when I was speaking with uh, Petrodal from Germany, she said Germany is now doing. Uh, an analysis of total water uh, storage uh, anomalies for uh, the, the entire country, and it's just nice for them. You know, they say we they say we're in drought. You know, how bad is it? You know, what's the time series like for Grace for the entire country? You know, and 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 dealing. You know, her questions were about leakage and stuff, but so. I, I think uh, maybe you're right, it's, uh, it will lead to policy, hopefully, and things like that. But it's nice for managers also to understand. I mean, if you're a reservoir manager and, uh, you know, you say, oh, well, the projected we're supposed to get normal precip. But normal precip is not enough to end a drought. You need uh, a family of atmospheric rivers or you need a flood, you know, or you need a change in end soil conditions. So uh, it takes a lot to end a flood or to end a drought. Uh, and so having having these in the back of your mind, and I think even though it's large scale, I think it's important for both managers and policy people to, to understand that and, and that we can advertise it more uh, to them and help them, you know, it would be their go-to, like their index groundwater well or something just like the U.S. drought monitor, you know, uh, someplace in drought, what state it is, you look at the U.S. drought monitor time series and you have the, the context, you know, um, so. <laughs> uh, 
Thanks for the presentation. Um, you alluded to, or you showed some results, a number of cases where you compared uh, GRACE data with model results. Uh, my understanding is that the majority of those models do not have a proper representation of groundwater processes below maybe the top metre or two. Um, can you comment on that and perhaps then the relevance of making those comparisons in the first place if they're not really capturing those deep groundwater dynamics? Uh, right. Um, I know wh wh when we did that study, some people said, well, why are you bothering? We know the models aren't doing a good job. Uh, but um, uh, Himanshu was really the, Himanshu Savi from C Center for Space Research was one that kind of um, got us interested in, in doing those comparisons. But the uh, global hydrologic models uh, were supposed to capture the, the water use, the pumpage and stuff like that from the deep aquifer systems. The land surface models weren't. Um, but uh, so each uh, group, uh, you know, at that time period, there weren't a lot of model intercomparison projects uh, uh, for these types of models. And they really didn't uh, know that uh, um, water gap hydrologic model and PCR global hydrologic model were really that different. And we had all of those people that developed those models as co-authors, you know, so they had a chance to rerun their models. They didn't understand why the Amazon was so poor. And so when those people put out papers on using a single model for sea level rise, you say, come on, you know, that's not the forte of global models. Um, so uh, the land surface model sometimes by chance but also they're starting to incorporate water management, irrigation, and other things. And so now the intersectoral intercomparison, model intercomparison project now um, simulates total water storage and has it as part of their uh, model intercomparison project and as more bring grace more into data simulation mode and constraining the models. And I think uh, the USGS will start to do it in the US with their regional models as they become more familiar with it and so and see the value. So, um, yeah, maybe we shouldn't have done it. It wasn't funded, you know, but I didn't have a life. So <laughs> just um, it, it was interesting. And I, I really appreciated the global modelers participating, you know, because they weren't funded either, you know, so so it was nice and Zixi and Zhang uh, from um, Wuhan, Cass, Cass in Wuhan was the leader of uh, that work, you know, so uh, in processing the data. Also like Yoshiwara's work, right? Once you start building these human components or some representation of them in the model, then what do you calibrate it with? How do you, right? So, so maybe the trends in grace are a target for those models once they do include groundwater or human activity that they need to try to meet those trends. Over right. Over. And so Petra just said, uh, Petra Dahl was just saying this morning that uh, uh, water gap is one of the few global models that they calibrated to the um, mean annual stream flow and, and they generally performed better than the others than uh, when the, in the model to comparison projects, you know, because of that calibration, but they didn't want to overfit it. They didn't want to be modifying a lot of parameters and stuff like that. So. Uh, but I mean, the UN and all these groups rely heavily on these models. And so, uh, you know, you want to show, uh, are they reliable and just uh, get people to look at more data, use more satellite data or other things. Thank you. Uh, let's end it there. Uh, if there's no more questions online or in the room, then uh, let's thank Bridget for your talk. Thank you very much. And uh, please feel free to come up and ask additional questions or say hi.